Hi, everybody. I'm Marty Brockstein, Senior Vice President of Industry Relations and Information for Licensing International. We're the global trade organization for companies in the business of trademark licensing. And thanks to the people at Insight X for inviting us to talk about the licensing business. Peter? Hi, my name is Peter Hollow. Um, I'm responsible for licensing, licensing international in Germany. Um, I'm really happy to be here, really happy to be invited to show some insights about the German markets, about the German market, uh, while uh, Marty will give you some insights in general. Is that right, Marty? Yep, I think we'll be looking at the global business and, and patterns and trends that we see going on. Okay, great, so let's get started. Okay, so we're here to talk about licensing. And uh, let me tell you first a little bit about Licensing International, just so you understand who we are and what we do. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're the global trade organization for companies in the business of licensing trademarks. And that, that encompasses uh, entertainment and character brands and in sports and, and the fashion world and corporate trademarks and, and a host of other things uh, where uh, licensees uh, license the properties in to put on products and services. Uh, we're a global organization with about 1,300 member companies around the world. We happen to be based in the U.S., but we're a, a fully global organization. So we're going to talk about licensing. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to show you a bunch of numbers at the beginning just to give some context to the size of this business. Uh, the numbers are taken from our annual global licensing industry study, uh, which uh, we've been conducting for six years now. And um, it, it is a uh, massive research project tr to try to put, a, uh, put some context into the business. Next slide. Okay, before I get started with the numbers though, I'm going to give, uh, this is a, a wonderfully American phrase, the elephant in the room. It means the, the unspoken factor in the business or, or in the world, uh, frankly, that everyone knows is there, but um, you, you don't really talk about. And that's obviously the pandemic that has affected the, the business in 2020 and who knows how far beyond. So I'm going to be showing you numbers from 2019 um, that will show the size of the business and its component parts and all that. And we have to understand that, that uh, the pandemic has interrupted uh, the normal course of business for everybody, the normal course of life for everybody. So we have, to, we have to kind of put that context aside. So I'm going to talk about 19 and the patterns that we see in the business, including uh, the, the current business. Um, but uh, we, we should always keep that factor in mind as we try to look forward and project. Next. Okay, so the, the global licensing business, the business of licensing trademarks, um, reached its highest point ever in 2019, uh, $292.8 billion of retail sales and services. Um, that's a huge number that people don't always uh, you know, totally comprehend. Um, that's 4.5% higher than it was in 2018. And that's the largest in the six years we've been doing this, the survey, that's the largest annual year on year gain that the business has seen. Um, over three years, it's, been, uh, it's grown at 11.4%. So it's been a solid upward trend in the licensing business. Next. Okay, so we break down the business in, in a couple of different ways. Um, one is by type of property. In other words, the, the kind of thing uh, that's being licensed. Um, there's the entertainment character segment, uh, which encompasses movies and TV shows and, and children's characters and things of that sort. There's the corporate brand sector. It might be a Harley Davidson or, or um, some such corporate brand, which is licensed out onto products and services. Uh, the fashion business um, is a licensing business in large part. 
uh, sports, uh, whether it's Bundesliga or the NBA or, or the Olympics uh, is another big uh, pillar of the business. And you can see that, that entertainment character is the largest sector of the business, um, encompassing 44% uh, of that 292 billion. And uh, corporate brands are the second largest and fashion is the third. So um, there's one, there's one uh, sector there, collegiate, which is very big in the US in particular. And actually if you put, and much of that is driven by collegiate athletics. So if you put collegiate and sports together, it's actually just as big as fashion. Next. We also break it down by the merchandise categories into which licenses go. Uh, the largest are the apparel and toy and fashion accessories business, but you'll note on the large, uh, on the left side of this uh, pie chart, uh, paper products, uh, that's 3% of the global business, that's an $8 billion category for licensing, uh, a significant um, solid part of the business uh, of licensing. Next. And another way we break it down is by region of the world. Um, as I mentioned, we're a global organization um, and uh, we're based in the US, um, but uh, more than 60% of our membership actually comes from outside the US. The member companies are based outside the US. That said, the US has the largest uh, consumption market, uh, US and Canada as, as we group them, the largest consumption market for licensed uh, goods. Um, at, and it grew at 4.5% uh, this year. It's about, uh, I believe it's uh, about 57, 58% of the global marketplace. Western Europe is the, is the second largest. And you can see um, the others on this chart. Um, the largest uh, growth is coming in some of the emerging markets in Latin America, um, Southern Asia and Northern Asia are, are three of the biggest uh, growth markets uh, going forward. Next. So before we get into some trends and, and, and topics uh, within the licensing business that you should understand, I think there's a really important thing to, to really comprehend about what's going on in in the business world in general, in the consumer products business, whether it's toys or paper products or apparel, whatever. Everybody is trying to get straight to the consumer. Um, with the, uh, the advent of the internet and e-commerce and, and social commerce and all, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit about later, um, everybody is trying to sell direct to the consumer. Um, the brand owners, be they movie studios or fashion houses or, or sports leagues, they all have their own e-commerce sites. So they're trying to sell directly to the consumer. Most licensees have their own e-commerce sites. They are trying to sell directly to the consumer. And of course, the retailers, be they full-fledged e-commerce or e-com uh, slash uh, brick and mortar, you know, physical retail, Everybody is trying to sell direct to the consumer. So everybody is sort of frenemies, uh, you know, an English mashup of a word. Uh, they're both friends uh, and they're trying to do business with, with each other, but they're also competing with each other. So um, it's a really interesting state of affairs in terms of the entire consumer products business um, that everybody is trying to figure out how to navigate in the most effective and profitable way possible. So now we're going to get into a bunch of uh, topics and, and trends within the licensing business, within the retail business, within society that, that uh, we think are, are really important to understand within the context of this business. So I'll uh, turn this over for the moment to Peter. Yeah, thanks, Marty. Uh, thanks for your, for your uh, do you see me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, thanks, Marty, once again for your great insights and all your great numbers. And uh, in, in the following, we've got we will talk about some um, trends and topics. And uh, first trend, big trend, massive trend in Germany is sustainability. Um, over the years, parties like the Green Party had a big impact on German society. Um, 
you know, Fridays for Future was a big movement. We all know that. So everything that's connected to sustainability is one of the really, really mega trends in Germany. And this is much more than, than just greenwashing for the companies. And that's the important message. Um, it's something to show purpose. It's show, to show purpose, what does your company stand for? And consumers have very, very clear preferences. They really prefer companies who have made their homework on sustainability and much more um, the younger generation, younger target audiences, they really check companies, are they doing their homework on sustainability? One part of sustainability, of course, is veganism. That's the next trend in Germany. Everything that's connected to veganism, artificial meat, and anything that goes with it. This is another really important trend in Germany. Um, not really new, maybe on the market since three or four years, but still massively growing. The other side of this trend is the decline of the German automotive industry. So you can see anybody who hasn't done the homework on this um, are facing problems. So this is a true self-made tragedy. So please do your homework on sustain st sustainability. Oh, that's so difficult words that I use. Yeah. Before we move on to the next, to the next topic, um, I would just like to add one thing. Um, that word sustainability is is used an awful lot, and I think it doesn't have a single definition. Um, I think if you ask 10 people to define the word sustainability, you might get 15 different definitions. Um, and you have to be very, very careful that you're not just using it as a marketing buzzword. Um, as Peter said, it's very, very, it's increasingly important to a large uh, portion of the consumer uh, base. And if they feel, you know, he, he used the word greenwashing, if they feel that you're just using it as a marketing buzzword and not following through on that, um, it can be very injurious. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a factor that's very much here to, here to stay. The pandemic has only sort of intensified people's uh, feelings about, um, manufacturing in, a, in, a, in an ecologically responsible way and, and things of that sort, so. Exactly, Marty. And the next point is DTR, directly to retail. Um, as you already mentioned, the, 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 it was your, what do you call it, frenemies? Everybody is selling to everybody. This DTR is a part of this, everybody is selling to anybody. Um, it's, it still is some kind of, yeah, let's call it some kind of exotic animal in Germany. Um, it's, it's you, there are, uh, direct to retail deals, uh, but it's not too many of them. Um, but it's a big, big trend because a lot of people, a lot of companies, a lot of, uh, IP owners are thinking of, um, going directly to retail because it's a really, really massive opportunity for all these IP owners because um, you eliminate certain tiers in, in the process, in, in your way to the market, and you, you get the full money. Let's call it like this. So this is why this is so interesting for anybody not to use maybe an agent or a licensee if you have, a, if you have an IP. Uh, and you're able to go to retail, retail directly, um, yeah, this will open a lot of uh, opportunities for you. Just, just to, um, to further define that, um, I'm, I'm a former journalist, and when I first started covering the retail business uh, 30, 40 years ago, uh, most retailers were just retailers. Um, at this point, many major retailers have large sourcing operations, so they often will take the licenses themselves rather than just buying licensed goods from a third party. So that's where this direct-to-retail licensing uh, comes in. Um, and it's a way for, them, for the retailer to gain exclusivity um, and to be assured that nobody else is going to compete with them on price. Um, or, uh, you know, they have their, the designs that they want or th something of that sort. So that direct to retail trend has been growing, as Peter said, um, perhaps, you know, more so in other parts of the world. 
um, but it, it's uh, it's on a growth it's on a growth curve uh, everywhere. Marty already mentioned it. It's e-commerce and S-commerce. I don't think we have to talk about what e-commerce is. I think everybody knows what's going on in the market. Uh, but I think we have to talk about S-commerce because that's that's the new e-commerce, so to say. Um, a lot of the black platforms that weren't commerce platforms um, all introduced models of making money in the retail sector. Facebook, Instagram, all of them have some kind of shopping tool and um, um, social networks or um, related companies who don't have it now are thinking of installing these tools. So this will be one of the really, really big trends as well, the S-commerce trend, because it goes very straight to the consumer. It goes very unfiltered, very straight to the consumer with a very direct feedback from the consumer itself himself or herself, and this is what makes it so interesting for, for companies. And, and the next phase of that going forward, well, for, first of all, I mean, obviously e-commerce in particular has gotten a, a large boost from the pandemic. Um, you know, to a certain extent, people had few other ways to buy uh, things beyond uh, the staples. Um, but the next, the next phase is probably uh, toward interactive shopping. Um, I'm watching something on TV. I see somebody using a product and there's a buy button on the screen and I click it and, and buy it instantly. It might be a dress. It might be uh, a cool notebook. It might be whatever it is. But that will be the next phase where you're watching a show uh, an entertainment show, but yet there is a buy button so that you can uh, purchase things as you see them. Um, you know, so, so much of brand loyalty and, and uh, shopping is done via emotion. Um, and emotion is the highest at the moment at which the consumer is interacting with something, wherever they are. So, um, uh, you know, again, e-commerce has grown, S-commerce is growing, and uh, probably the next phase is, is about interactive shopping. Right. Digital properties. Uh, um, we often very much concentrate on what's, what's going on in movie theaters, for instance, because uh, the market for character licensing is so huge. But there are other markets we can look at, and that's everything that goes on on the internet, which is dig digital. Um, for instance, the, 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 the market for video games or for gaming is a much, much larger market than the movie market, than the movie theater market, than the movies market. So um, I think what, what can be a, a good strategy for the future is look, look into these properties, what's happening there, and, um, and grab the opportunities that you can have for licensing. Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, five years ago, did anybody know what esports was? That's a huge marketplace right now with its own set of stars and, and, uh, and, and you know, new uh, personalities. Uh, nobody knew what an influencer was. Uh, the YouTube influencers, uh, Instagram influencers um, have popped up and are now a a large part of the culture. The licensing business is built on whatever's happening in the popular culture. Um, so, so uh, you know, 80 years ago, everybody was talking about radio stars, and those were the licensing properties of that day. Then it came TV stars, et cetera, et cetera. Now, so much of modern entertainment and, and cultural life is coming digitally and with its own set of, of um, uh, known personalities and, and things of that sort. So you have to stay on top of the popular culture in order to tie in to the licensing business. Tried and true. I think that's just the opposite side of what we talked about, Marty, right? right. Yes. And it's, it's, I think that's a very, very common thing that in times of uncertainty or in times of a crisis, people are generally uh, looking for, for things they know. And uh, the, the situation that we have right now is, 
is made for traditional brands because uh, people, they know them, they, they feel warm, they feel cozy, they feel safe and secure, and they, they feel that the brands are something, you know, like old friends, and they exactly act this way. So if you uh, currently own brands or properties which are um, somewhat in a positive way, old fashioned, uh, no, no problem, because right now is the best time to make money out of it. Um, People have made their good experiences. People might, these things might remind them of their own childhood maybe. So this is a really, really interested, interesting time for, for very traditional brands um, to, to, to sustain. Absolutely, there's not much to add there. I mean, you even take it to something like the food business. Yeah. Um, where, you know, I'm not sure if the phrase translates, but in the U.S. is known as comfort foods, uh, yeah. things that, uh, you know, meatloaf and then things that, that as, as Peter said, give you warm memories. And it's something, you know, is kind of like a, a base uh, for you to tie into. So, uh, you know, while everybody is always tri chasing the latest trends, uh, in a business sense, uh, this is a time often when the tried and true does come to the front. Related to tried and true is my home is my castle. Um, we can all see that in the, in the current situation, um, there are industries that, that are massively growing in Germany, for instance, the whole furniture, home decor market, DIY stores, delivery services, um, people who sell mobile homes and stuff, everything of this is a is a is on a massive hype right now. Um, the the for 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 example the the mobile home industry they have doubled their sales numbers in 2020, and um, this is nothing uh, else as my home is my castle because you have your home to take with you. You feel safe and secure, and um, I think this is one of the one of the trends with the how to call it the longest long longevity uh, i think we'll we'll have this for the next 5 to 10 years and everybody who has um has things related to this um has a very good chance to to create a sustainable business on this yeah i mean uh, not not much to add to that one um i think that everybody during the pandemic at various times is spending much more time at home than they had before and uh so uh, they're, they're paying more attention um, in terms of consumption to things they're using at home and upgrading things and making themselves more comfortable. Speed. We've talked about a lot, a lot of cozy and, <laughs> and slow things, uh, but now we have to talk about speed because uh, that's the other point. It's everything right now is about speed. And um, it's not like, you know, that the, the, the large company always wins. It's, it's the, the fast company overcoming the large companies right now. And if you have this perfect mixture of being very large and being very, you're almost unbeatable. And we can see that the big um, American online retailers are showing us how this works. Uh, we have to learn it in Europe. Uh, we already have companies who are able to do this, but um, they showed us how this how this works. Um, but it's not only it's not only um, being fast as a company is is uh, it's being fast in your mindset as well. Um, currently, trends are, cha are changing so fast. Uh, usually, you had this you know had this big trend for one year right now or for half a year and right now you have this week next week and in three weeks and this could be completely different things going on and so these these trends come very quickly and they go very quickly so you have to find ways uh, to adapt your business to this i i was struck by uh, something that uh, one of the top executives of the large american chain target stores said um that at this point, um, merchandise planning happens in two week increments. Um, it used to be something like four month increments, things of that sort. So, so everybody has to be agile. Um, as Peter said, trends happen and leave quickly. 
Um, so you have to stay on top of them. One of the ways in which this is being reflected is maybe um, uh, there's more small batch manufacturing. Rather than manufacturing massive quantities of something, you're, ma you're manufacturing smaller quantities. That plays into sustainability also in terms of there's less bad inventory that you'll have to destroy or, or dispose of down the road, but it allows you to be much more, much faster on your feet and to react to the trends and, uh, and react to your, cu your customers' needs. Collaborations. Um, another big thing, united we stand, that's the old saying, and that's pretty true if we talk about strategic uh, collaborations um, within companies. Um, it's, no, it's really no sign of weakness sharing something or sharing your strength. No, it's just the other way around. You, 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 you get something uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you can use for yourself. Um, pro with, with all these collaborations, for instance, you will, you will get new target audience, for instance, or you, you can change or boost your brand reputation. You can open new, new sales channels or a couple of other things that, are, that, that could be interesting for you uh, that you would have never reached if you would have, if you would, would have not found the right collaboration. What, whatever, what everybody's looking for is for one plus one to equal five. Um, you take a strong brand with a particular audience and another brand with a particular audience. If you can combine them in some way on a product, um, hopefully you'll get both of those audiences and, and others who might not have thought of those brands in the same way. So it's a way of introducing your brand to a different uh, uh, set of consumers. And hopefully, uh, as I said, one plus one will equal five. Don't have to explain this in Germany. In Germany, in retail, everything is about pricing. If I talk to people outside of Germany, there are a lot of different kinds of promotions. But in Germany, it's just price down. It's just markdowns, nothing else. So it's no, it's no surprise that we had a massive growth in, in the discount channel and the off-price channel, probably more than in the rest of the world. And uh, one thing has changed. Um, the, the, the discount channel and the off-price channel, they used to be some kind of, yeah, some kind of taboo. They, they, everybody wanted to work with them, but nobody wanted to be seen with them. Uh, but this has changed. This has changed. Meanwhile, meanwhile, they've reached a very, very interesting state as being indispensable for the industry to, to reach certain target groups and to, to, to um, simply to grow distribution or to, and to create awareness for their brands. So it's, it's, it's absolutely impossible today working without these off-price channels. Yeah, I think the orientation for many brands has changed from, ooh, I don't want to be in that channel to I have to figure out a strategy so that I can live in that channel plus my other channels, whether it's different packaging sizes, whether it's uh, a sub-brand or something of that sort, but everybody feels that, that they now have to have a, uh, a strategy rather than just uh, turning up their nose at, at, at being in that neighborhood. Exactly. So I wanted, so wanted to spend a couple minutes uh, talking about today and, and given the reality of COVID and, and uh, everything that's going on. Um, and there are a couple of points uh, we wanted to make before we, uh, we wrap it up. Uh, one is that, you know, with all the upset in business and, and all and, and, and the, the uh, interruption of, of normal life, consumers are still consuming. So they might be acquiring the goods differently. E-commerce is bigger than it was. Um, um, shopping services and things of that sort. But consumers are still consuming, so there is business to be done. Um, I think, you know, as we mentioned in our, in our trends, the power of brands has been accented. Um, brands, uh, you know, we could do an hour session on, on what the meaning of the word brand is. Uh, but to me, what a brand is, it's, it's a promise of performance. And, uh, you know, it, it implies whether it's a sense of humor or trust or whatever, 
But that trust factor is really a big part of the power of brands that plays into the licensing business. Uh, E-commerce is obviously gaining a lot of strength. Um, uh, and some of that, you know, some of that strength is obviously going to hang on going forward. It might uh, moderate somewhat, but it's, uh, you know, e-commerce, uh, the growth path for e-commerce is, is obviously set. And uh, as we mentioned, in terms of speed, uncertainty and constant reevaluation, that's by everybody. Consumers are uncertain about their futures and their circumstances, and they're constantly reevaluating. Do I need this? Do I want this? Can I give myself a treat? Um, retailers uh, are uncertain about what the consumer marketplace look like. They are also uncertain about supply. Uh, supply chain concerns have definitely risen. So, so uh, as we talked about with the target executive uh, mentioning uh, the merchandise planning is in two week increments now, there is this constant reevaluation going on and that's, that's going to be with us for quite some time until things return to quote unquote a, a new normal. And the questions about tomorrow and Peter feel free to chime in at any point. Uh, questions. How will consumers experience brands? Um, you know, are they going to be strolling through stores or through malls the way they once did? Or is everything going to be an online experience? So you have to think about that when you're marketing your brands and your products. How, how are uh, consumers going to uh, find them and, and, and interact with them? Um, for the licensing business, particularly the entertainment sectors of the business and sports, what will happen to all these businesses that are built on bringing people together in one place? Um, you know, uh, fans in the stands at a, at a, uh, a Bundesliga match, um, concerts, uh, theme parks, cruise ships. Um, by the way, we've just defined the Walt Disney Company. So they are particularly challenged to, uh, to figure out how do we go forward? Uh, you know, what is the strategy and, and uh, what is the next normal? What, what are things going to look like in three months, in six months down the road? Uh, a lot of that will depend on the medical side um, and, and vaccines and things of that sort and how, you know, how quickly we can put the pandemic behind us, but nobody really knows. So what will be the shape of that next normal? So, Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Um, we, uh, we really enjoyed this. And, and again, thanks to the, uh, to the show organizers for inviting us. And uh, you have our contact information and we look forward to hearing from you. And uh, we hope you'll uh, think about the licensing business and, and a lot of what we've just said. So thanks everybody. Yeah, thanks from my side as well. Thanks everybody for listening. I hope that was some some interesting points for you. And uh, yeah, thanks to all the through the organizers uh, for inviting us. And yes, yeah, see you soon. Thank you.